It's Hot Now 37, hotnow37.com, man. We're going through a lot these days, and I had to get a good friend of mine on the phone, the chief of police, Neil Dreif. How you doing, Neil? I'm doing well, DJ. Thanks. I appreciate you taking the time out to call me right now in these, in these trying times right now. The country's going through a lot, and um, you being a, a chief of police, you've been in the, on the force for a long time. You've seen a lot. Have you ever seen anything like what we're going through right now? No, this is a lo- this is different. Look, I, I've been a police officer in Connecticut for 30 years. I started in, in February of 1990. So for people who are old like us, right, you do the <laughs> math on that. That means uh, less than just over a year after I graduated from the police academy, the Rodney King beating happened in Los Angeles. And things like this have happened periodically over the course of the whole 30 years that, I, that I've been a police officer. Right. But, but this this level of, of unrest and the, the level of violence that, that seems to be happening all across the country in, in, in cities from coast to coast, from, from north to south, uh, you know, and, and just the, the sheer numbers of people who are involved. Um, you know, talking to, uh, I was on a conference call with the Police Chiefs Association in Connecticut for almost two hours yesterday, and a number of people who've been around a long time commented that, that it feels different this time. Do you think it's a combination of what the, what the world is going through with the um, coronavirus and everyone being locked down and this happened and people just were fed up? Like say, they said, this is the last straw. What else do you want us to do? We want answers. Yeah, look, I, I certainly think that has something to do with it. I mean, these were already trying times, you know, around the world, not just to, not just in the United States, but around the world with this this virus and 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 these lockdown orders, things that things that people in in this country have never experienced. I certainly haven't. Uh, being you know being told by order of governors and and the federal government that you have to stay home and you should socially distance and wear masks and and these things were already happening and people were already suffering and struggling. Business owners people who were out of work, all those, all those things I'm sure combined. And then when you, when you put the additional spark in there of, a, of an incident of completely unwarranted, illegal police brutality, yeah. uh, I'm sure that is the, that in many, in, in the view of many people, that was the, the straw that broke the camel's back or the, the final straw, the spark that started a lot of this. And people were already frustrated and angry and, and hurting for a lot of other reasons, and and again, that may just have been the, the thing that really got people, set people off this time. Yeah, it's hot nine three seven hot nine three seven dot com. It's DJ Buck. We got Chief of Police Neil Dreif on the phone with us right now. Me, I've always wanted to be a DJ. My whole life, I wanted to be who I am right now. I I I, I worked hard to be who I am right now, and I'm sure you, as a young man coming up, you wanted to grow up in protective serve, and help the community. And now it looks like the people are saying you guys are the bad guys. Do you? How do you feel? Them painting a picture like that when it's something that you've always wanted to do. You know, it's it's. I, I think the most frustrating thing for a lot of a lot of police officers, not just police chiefs. I mean, this is a this is a, an issue that you know. I talk to a lot of, of police officers. Not like once you get to be chief, you only talk to other chiefs, and you right. have to talk to to the regular cops out on the out on the streets every right. day doing doing the job. And to a person, I haven't heard one person say, "Oh, well, I can understand how that happened." Oh, the guy was struggling with them. He was fighting with them. Nobody says that. Everybody looks at it and says that was wrong. I think the frustrating thing, particularly here in Connecticut, where I think we've done a lot of very, very good work over the years in building relationships and changing laws and changing policies, increasing training and, and, the, and diversity and, and just uh, you name it, uh, you know, send a kid to camp and all these things that are that are sponsored by police departments around the state of Connecticut to to see something happen a thousand miles away in a police department where nobody here has ever worked in a city that many people here have never visited hmm. and to realize that people look at that incident and immediately think, well, that's all police. That is, that's, that's, that could happen here tomorrow. Um, you know, that has happened here and, you know, it just wasn't on camera. So people got away with it. And I think that is the that is the frustrating thing. And I, I think the concern that 
police chiefs in particular have is that is that this is going to this is going to do long term damage to the things the relationships that we've worked so hard to build up here for things that were not for, because something happened that was completely beyond our ability to control right meaning this the incident with Mr. Floyd in Minneapolis that was completely beyond the ability of a police officer or a police chief or a police supervisor in Connecticut to prevent or or you know do anything about but we are going to the relationship that we have with our communities here is going to suffer because of that. Now, Neil, I had, I had a, a text. I get calls and texts from people every day, especially now. This one came from a friend of mine named Anthony. He said the treatment of black people by police will not change until legislation for law enforcement is changed and mandatory training for all law enforcement is adjusted. They have to know they are, they are held accountable for their actions before putting on their uniform every day. Training, new ways to train. Is that something we should look at? Yeah, so there's an old saying, and and I, I when anytime I tell people this thing, I always have to make sure I, I this is not my thing, and and unfortunately I don't know who said it first. But the the, the thing is when you when you know better, you do better, mm, right? Yeah. That's a, and that's what you know training that that's that's what's at the heart of training. But I got to tell you, I don't know that there is a a, a piece of paper, a training program, a, a law that could be written. That is going to completely prevent any future incident of police misconduct or brutality or criminality. Um, I think there are laws and policy. Again, look, every police department. I again, a lot of a lot of talking over the course of the last week amongst police chiefs and, and police officers. Again, I've been a police officer in Connecticut for over 30 years now. Not one time ever. I cannot find a single person, and I can tell you in my 30 years, I have never been taught or trained in how to apply a neck restraint to somebody. Wow. It is just not something that we have ever been, been trained in here in Connecticut. And that's, look, that's on a statewide level. Um, I, you know, I've talked to people who've been, you know, police officers for a couple of weeks, and I've talked to people who've been police officers for longer than I have. Nobody's ever been trained how to do a neck restraint here. But there are other parts of the country where apparently the neck restraint is still something that is that is trained. It, it again, I don't think that should be uh, that should be something that that we should be training police officers to do. It's inherently dangerous. And the argument can be made that if it's properly applied, it can end a violent situation very quickly. But if it's improperly applied, it can kill somebody. Yeah. So, you know, you got to balance that there. But again, I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. As long as we have to hire human beings to be police officers, and once we train them and educate them, we have to send them out to deal with other human beings, I think there are going to be mistakes made, crimes committed, instances of brutality and overreaction. But we have to strive to do our very best every day to overcome those. If a police chief becomes aware that a police officer is not doing the right thing when they are out there conducting their duties in the name of the people they are sworn to protect and serve, then we have a responsibility to discipline them, to retrain them, and to fire them if they don't get the message. Exactly. And that is something that we strive to do every single day all across this country. And again, I Sure. There can we always do better? Absolutely. And I think that we strive to do better. Again, in Connecticut, we work very hard. We don't just wait for situations to happen before we address them. We've been very proactive in training and putting together mandatory policies that every police department in the state of Connecticut has to follow. Not just, hey, you can do this if you want, you know, because you're in Hartford or New Haven or one of the other large cities. But somebody out in the suburbs doesn't have to. These are mandatory statewide policies on use of force and pursuits and training and things like that. And again, I think I think what you're seeing in Connecticut with the lack of the protests really turning violent and turning to looting and 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 arson and things like that. I think that's a, a I hope I hope that that is an indication that there is some level of trust in mm. the community in Connecticut that 
some recognition that their police departments and their police chiefs and their police officers have been working hard for years towards improving the relationship and making policing better and more fair and more impartial for every single resident of Connecticut. Uh, Chief, is it going to take a conviction for this thing to stop, for, for the looting to stop and for the protesting to stop, or will it just simmer it down into the next incident? You know, Buck. I don't. I don't know. Um, we know how the we know how the uh, how the, the criminal justice system works. It's a process. Right? It could be a long time before there's a trial. It's a process. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, it could be it could be months, if not if not a year, or maybe longer before there's even a trial. Huh. I don't know. I don't know that this country can survive. Some of these communities can't can't survive. Some no. of these cities aren't going to survive. If people are going to continue to to protest again, look, peaceful protest is productive. Right. I think that the violence and the arson, I, you know, every morning for the past week, I've woken up and the first thing I do is turn on the, the news and try to and, and hope that there hasn't been some sort of real tragedy that's gotten out of hand because, uh, you know, a, a an arson fire that was started as part of a protest didn't cause a gas main explosion and killed 14 people or something like that. Violence gets out of control. I worry about that every day because that is going to look. I think what we're seeing on a national level, unfortunately, and sometimes from the from the federal government, is there's already a lot of pressure to respond very harshly yes. to, to to this to these demonstrations. And, you know, there's a, a lot of talk at the federal level to respond with overwhelming force and dominate people. I mean, that I, I that makes me I'm I'm that makes me afraid to be to be honest. Yeah, it Buck. scares I, me I, every day. And those, it scares those me every tactics day. will spiral out of control and they will take the message away from the people on both sides the police and the protesters who are trying to work towards reform and accountability and making things better. And people will just separate into their, you know, separate sides of this. And it's going to get bad. It, will, it could be it really bad. Get yeah. Out of control. It's like the United States of America isn't so united right now. It is not. It, it is not. And that is a that is a very, very troubling and sad uh, commentary on on what is what is going on in our country. Neil, I got to thank you for taking the time out to call. I know it's a tough time for a, for a police officer right now, and, and for you being around for all these years and, and having to go through this and see what's happening right now. And um, I got to just thank you for calling, man. I really appreciate it. You bet. Look, Buck, thank you for the opportunity because you know what? This is how we're going to make this better by talking to one another, not talking past each other and yeah. not letting it get caught up in what's happening in other parts of the country. This is how we're going to make it work, by sitting down with each other, by talking and trying to make things better. And I believe that the police departments, police officers, and the, most importantly, the community in Connecticut wants that to be the way that it is and is dedicated and committed to making that happen. Sometimes it takes uncomfortable conversations to, to make progress. You you absolutely have that correct, sir. Neil, thanks for calling. Have a, have a great day, and I appreciate it again. Thank you. Absolutely. Man.